Welcome. This is the third in our series of interviews produced here at La Trobe University Bandura Campus 2011. And I'm delighted to welcome a distinguished colleague from La Trobe University, Dr. Jan Liebig from the School of Economics and Finance. Jan studied in Prague and Sydney, produced research on monetary theory and policy, and he was also voted as the best teacher of La Trobe for 2009 and 2010. And Jan promised to speak about economics in a language that we can all understand. So that's a challenge for you today. <laughs> I'm hoping to be able to deliver on my promise. Takže vítaj na pôde Univerzity La Trobe a ja som rád, že môžem niečo aj po slovensky povedať, lebo ja som tu ešte hostia z Československa nemal. A ďakujem za pozvanie a som rád, že môžu promluviť pred tými studenty. Well, we will speak in English, of course, but I just wanted to show off that we can speak a language that is more exotic than that, because Jan, like myself, is originally from Czechoslovakia, that is the Czech Republic today. Well, for me, it's uh, Slovakia today, but we are not going to talk about Czechoslovakia, or not that much anyway. We will focus on the area of your research, which is the um, monetary union of, of uh, uh, the EU, or the, the common European currency. And I want to ask you to start with, was that a good idea to have a common currency? You see, I was in Dublin, in Ireland, when the currency was introduced. And I attended lectures presented by distinguished, smart economists who were able to marshal evidence in favor of the common currency and against it, you know? And I wasn't quite sure who was right then. Now we know better. Um, well, it's still, the answer is still not obvious, but what we had prior to the, uh, um, uh, the, the monetary union was a, a number of pros and a number of cons, and there were two camps. Some people were arguing that obviously the pros are more important, some that the cons are more important, and, and, and basically the discussion continues up until the, the present moment. But there are sophisticated theories about this. The economists talk about the optimum currency area. Uh, would you say that then, at least in the way in which the euro was adopted, including countries like Greece, Ireland in fact, Portugal, and we'll talk about them in more detail later on, was it a sensible move for Europeans to take? It, um, I think in, in some ways it was, and it, it could have really uh, worked. In fact, it, it still can work. Uh, well, it is working. <laughs> Europeans use the euro. Yeah? <laughs> well, it is working. Uh, if you look at some of the outcomes, uh, uh, you could argue that there's some uh, problems associated with it. But, but certainly, as the idea is such, uh, it had a lot of uh, kind of theoretical back backing, and, and there were many uh, ideas that, that were discussed, and, and, and overall, it could be a good idea. I mean, the, the main... The main pro of, uh, of having an uh, independent country to, to adopt a common currency is, is the fact that it promotes trade. It, it improves the, the linkages between countries. It, it gets rid of the um, exchange rate risk and, and the cost of, of, of having to exchange currencies. It, it, um, it, it enables you to pull risk. If you, have, if you combine different countries that have various different risks that you, you, you might be able to better insure against those, those risks. So there, there are many, and, and obviously once you, you join um, um, uh, through a common currency, that also enables a free flow of labor. And then again, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, so again, there were some strong arguments for, uh, for at least considering. And if you think about a, another real world example of a, of a currency union, uh, think about the United States and I guess most people would, would agree that uh, it's, it's worked in the United States and the, the advantages have more than outweigh the, the, the disadvantages. So there were strong uh, economic arguments in favor of the common currency, but there are also well very, <laughs> very important political arguments in favor. Would you, would you like to explain um, those? Well, I would f like to focus on the economics part of it, but certainly if you, uh, if you look at uh, what uh, Jacques Delors, one of, the, uh, one of the architects of the monetary model uh, of the European model, what he said in 1988, I think, he, he basically said that uh, he believes that one day 80% uh, of all the legislation is, is going to be written in Brussels. So, so basically there were many political ambitions of, of many individuals involved as well. So the arguments were not, not purely economic. Well, in fact, I, I, I suspect that for many European leaders, including national politicians, not just the 
well, you mentioned Jacques Delors, and of course he was then the president of the European Commission, uh, but he also needed uh, the support of national leaders like uh, François Mitterrand in, in France and Helmut Kohl in Germany. The idea was that the project of the common currency would bring the nations of Europe closer together. That is something tangible that they can experience, yeah? Right. No, that, that was certainly one of the, one of the other um, advantages that was floated around. And, and that's also um, kind of considered one of the disadvantages by some people, which is that, that uh, you lose some national kind of sovereignty. You, you lose some identity. Well, we all become European, but we, we become less Czechs and less Slovaks and less Spanish. So, and some people might have felt that that was, uh, that was a bad thing because they wanted to preserve that national identity. And what are then the economic disadvantages of the whole uh, concept? Well, well, obviously, the, the, um, the problem is that you lose, um, I mean, apart from uh, some of the relatively minor issues like the, the cost of the, uh, the adoption um, and the people kind of having to adjust uh, to, to the common currency and, and get used to it, um, you, you lose two important adjustment uh, mechanisms uh, that a country has. Um, one of them is the exchange rate. Often what happens if, if a country is is hit by, by some kind of shock, um, as we've seen recently, for example, with, with Iceland, um, an exchange rate uh, is, is an important kind of buffer because what happens, the currency depreciates, which makes uh, the, the production of the country more attractive um, from, from an external perspective. It makes the stuff cheaper. So it makes the economy kind of more competitive and it, it tends to recover faster. And again, if you give up your, uh, your currency, you don't have that, that mechanism. But what's probably even more important is, is giving up uh, autonomous monetary policy. And monetary policy is, um, for those of you who, who may not be familiar, it's, it's just a, a tool that the, the central bank in every country uses to, to manage the, the fluctuations of the economy. And it works through, uh, through interest rates and, and the amount of money, uh, money in the economy, but but in a nutshell, when, um, when the economy is kind of tends to overheat, um, meaning that inflationary pressures are, are likely to, um, to uh, follow, uh, the central bank tends to raise the interest rate and, and kind of take the heat out of the economy. A higher interest rate basically means that people don't go out and consume, but they, instead they save and, in, and, and firms tend to kind of defer investment. So that takes the, the kind of steam a little bit out of the economy and takes the inflationary pressures away. Um, and again, um, if you have a common currency, uh, you cannot really use that for individual countries because there's just one interest rate um, that has to be set based on the considerations of the whole uh, union rather than the individual countries. So the member states don't just lose currency as a source of the identity. And, and for Germans, for example, it was an important source mm. of German identity. Yeah, the, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas spoke about the Deutsche Mark nationalism, the German Mark nationalism, because that is where the kind of identity was, was channeled or through that currency, the identity was channeled. But you also lose kind of very practical policy mechanisms that you no longer have. Mind you, people like Andrew Moravchik, uh, a very influential scholar of uh, European integration, argues that this is precisely the reason, that the way you describe the role of the, the central bank uh, for Moravchik, illustrates nicely that there are certain functions that in most Western states are kind of located outside politics, yeah? that there is a kind of technocratic agreement about what a central bank should, should follow. And therefore, in Australia, for example, also, it is an independent institution. But in your research, you, you suggested that it's not always like that, that even though the central bank might be independent on paper. In reality, it is kind of embedded in political processes taking place. And that is uh, the problem that the Europeans face, right? Well, the, the importance of, of having an independent central bank that is kind of divorced from the political realities have become apparent after the 1970s, where we've had high inflation. And one of the main uh, kind of causes of that, uh, that, that the research has identified was precisely that the you know, the government was largely in charge of monetary policy uh, mm -hmm. and they tend to kind of abuse the role. That's why central banks have been made independent uh, um, in most countries uh, in the legislation. Now, what, you, what you're hinting towards is, uh, and again, this is not my novel idea, but it, 
it, it turns out that there's a, there's a, uh, there are link, interlinkages between monetary policy, again performed by the by the central bank, and and fiscal policy uh, performed by the government in the form of government spending and and and, and taxes, and um, um, and and the the interlink interlinkages is kind of really fine when everything's going well and both policies are well behaved. There's not really uh, much kind of spillover going on from one policy to the other. Whereas if, if you have a situation that you're facing currently in, in most countries where fiscal policy have really been excessive and not just, not just as in, a, in a reaction to the global financial crisis, excessive over the last two or three decades mm -hmm. and the countries have run a, a structural deficit and accumulated debt, that really uh, starts kind of putting monetary policy, even performed by an independent central bank, under pressure. Because you know, if you accumulate debt, there's really just three options that that uh, can happen. I mean, either the government will uh, implement some reform and and pay off the debt, which is largely what happened in Australia under the Howard government since uh, since mid '90s, or um, um, there'll be a default on debt, or what's called restructuring, which mm. is what uh, might happen in, in in many countries, including uh, mm. European countries. Or the third possibility, which is which is not uh, unrealistic by by any means, is, is the fact that the central bank will simply inflate the debt away to some extent. So by printing too much money and creating higher inflation, it it will kind of um, somehow reduce the real size um, of of the debt. Um, so this is precisely. But all, all three scenarios have have the uh, problems, of course, and all three scenarios to some extent would would go against the spirit of the. Maastricht Treaty, which Absolutely. created a kind of legal framework for the implementation of the currency. But I'm thinking when listening to what you described is that one could say that one of the basic problems with the project was that that the EU leaders, including those national politicians who embarked on the project, expected more political unification than really occurred. Yeah? They expected more harmonization of fiscal policies, etc. So that in some ways, one could say that, that the card was put before the horse or whatever that it often used image uh, has it. Yeah? That, that the common currency for it to work would have required much closer political integration. And the question now is you know, whether this is the most plausible response for EU elites and national politicians to take right now. Look, in terms of the assumptions that went um um, kind of into thinking about the, uh, the common currency. Um, obviously, uh, many people argue that you do need uh, a, a fiscal union uh, as, an, as a prerequisite for a well-functioning monetary union. And can uh, you describe what uh, that term entails, uh, fiscal union? Um, well, if you think within an individual country, um, in the United States of Australia, you've got independent states, but there's active redistribution from one region to another. So, in fact, they kind of coordinate um, um, fiscally. Um, now, I wouldn't go that far. I don't think this, uh, you know, having to have uh, like a, 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 a fiscal organization that basically decides uh, fiscal policy and, you know, spending decisions at the, at the European level is, well, is really necessary.